We were really pumping the bass this morning because that's the last time. So you get to hear it one last time. That was it. We're officially done with this series this week. I know. I know. You love feeling that bass right in your chest. Um, <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So um, a couple of things. So this week you'll see on your, on your seats there is the card that is an invitation for you to take. There should be about five in there for you to give out to friends. Just so you know what's coming next week on Sunday morning, you will be getting a different one of these, which is targeted for, or uh, not targeted for, that's not a good word. Um, it is more appealing to kids. So it's, this is the one that's like for adults. And then we have a separate one that we'll be giving out uh, next week. If you don't know, this week is Thanksgiving week. So uh, Springfield Public Schools, a lot of the different schools are actually uh, out this week. And so many people have already headed out, which is awesome. Yeah, uh, for us, I'm glad those people are gone. That did not come across right at all. So Liz, I and the kids are all, uh, we're flying out tomorrow morning up to Chicago, uh, trying to get the kids used to flying on a plane, which they've never done before. And so we're going to be taking them on their first plane flight this week. This does not qualify as a story about my kids. Uh, just if you're wondering, don't say anything to them about the fact that I mentioned them um, tangentially on this story about me. And all week long, or I know this week coming up that already I've been kind of thinking about all the things that need to be done. So we're flying into Chicago. We're spending the week there. Uh, Monday, we have groceries that are going to be delivered from, from Walmart to our Airbnb that we need to order tomorrow. We've already ordered uh, to my brother's house in, in uh, Kenosha groceries for us to be able to make our stuff for Thanksgiving for the family. Those are going to be delivered on Wednesday, and so we've already ordered that. So that's all going... like. I've been thinking about all the things that need to happen this week and all of the pieces that need to come into place. We need to pack this afternoon uh, to, in order to be able to uh, get load up on the plane and have our stuff. And we need to remember underwear and socks and all that stuff. And as I'm thinking about all those things, I, I noticed during worship I was thinking about them. And I was a little bummed by that, of course, as I stopped and I recognized that I'm, I'm thinking about things that really in this moment are not the most important thing to be thinking about. And just in general, I would say that that may not be just me this morning. And so as this is the end of this series called The Holy Spirit, I, I want to encourage you to just for one more, one more stretch, lock in. And let's see what he might say to us this morning. I know you got lots of stuff going on this week. You got to fry a turkey or roast a turkey or smoke a turkey or ham or whatever. Hams are Christmas, just so you know. <laughs> Turkeys are Thanksgiving. And some of you drove in and you're like, oh, praise has got a tree up already. What is this? And, and wreaths up. Come on, it's Thanksgiving. Um, and all of those things. Let's just, let's just, and let's just lock in. Would you join with me in that? Yes. Holy Spirit, yes. we just want you to speak to us. Yes. Even in our worship today, we were singing about Jesus Christ. And how beautiful and glorious and just wonderful he is. And we know that this is what you do in our lives. You make him just absolutely beautiful to us. And so this morning, even before all of the things that need to happen this week begin, I just pray that this time in particular, you would speak to each of us individually and just do a deep work. As we close this series up, may it be the type of thing where... We know we have met with you this morning. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So at the beginning of this series, I put three things on a shelf, where I asked you specifically to put three things on the shelf. And I told you we were going to revisit these things throughout the series. We've revisited two out of the three. The third was, I asked you to put your expectations of what something like this might or should look like. And today I want to stop and I want to return to that. What something like the Holy Spirit working in your life might look like. And today I want to challenge you, or not just challenge you, but to maybe just create in our minds a dream or a picture of what it could look like. 
And so I'm asking you today to just dream as we look towards the future for the Holy Spirit moving in your life and some of the areas that maybe you have yet to see that sort of thing manifest to just dream what it could look like for you. Um, we're kind of at the end of this series, but at the same time, I've, I've felt like for this series that this is the type of series that needs to end in the same way that the book of Acts ends. And I don't know if you've noticed, but when I read that book of Acts, it just ends abruptly. It stops, and it seems as if it ought to keep going. If you come to the end of it, Acts chapter 28, last two verses, verse 30 and 31 just says this. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, so this is after he ends up in Rome, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and no one tried to stop him. It feels kind of incomplete. It doesn't feel like that's like, hey man, we just went through the book of Luke and Acts, two books together, and this is just, you'd expect some kind of a big punch at the end, but it just kind of ends in such a way that it feels as if it's ongoing. In fact, Paul probably doesn't die right after this. And there's a few reasons why people think that that's the case. Like verse 33 of Acts chapter 28 is probably not Paul's death. Because the imprisonment here does not seem to match with the imprisonment in 2 Timothy, which is the end of his life when he realizes it's coming to an end. And so many people believe, including me, that this is not the end of Paul, but that actually from here he heads off to Spain and then ends up coming back around and ending back in Rome. And at that point, there's like the second imprisonment, which is a little bit more of an intense imprisonment. Here, even the last couple verses, it's like he's just living in Rome at his own expense, and everybody who wants to visit him can. This doesn't seem like somebody who is just about to be executed. And so it doesn't feel right. And so in many ways, I believe that Paul does go off, and, and this is not the end for Paul. What I do know is this, that whether it's the end for Paul or not, it is not the end of the story, that the book of Acts and the stories that you find there are our story, and that we continue the Acts story. In fact, we are living Acts 29 now. The continuation, this, the stuff that happens here is the continuation happens with us. And so I guess that's my hope also for this series as it comes to an end, that it would not be the end, that it would instead be something else, that it would be the beginning for some of us, especially the beginning of a new thing in our lives as we open ourselves up to what does the Holy Spirit have for me, that a radical openness for what he has next would be the result for, for us. And and even as I think about, I guess, even the way to end this series, I, I think of that quote by Winston Churchill, when uh, the Allies had moved in, they, they were starting in Europe, but they were also making a tremendous amount of progress in northern Africa. And so somebody says to him, he says, is this, is this the end of the war? Because they were making just so much progress. And Churchill said, no, this isn't the end. This isn't even the beginning of the end. If anything, it's the end of the beginning. Which, that's Winston Churchill. He just, he had ways of saying things that you're like, ah, oh, that's good. And, and so I think that I'm going to steal that. And for today's sermon, we're going to call this the end of the beginning. My hope is that this series, and as we wrap up today, that this would be the end of the beginning of a new thing for all of us, but especially for some of us. And I hope you're with me in that, the end of the beginning. To, to do that, we're going to go back to the beginning today. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1. We're going to be reading in Acts chapter 1. In fact, we're going to read all of Acts chapter 1 today. Last week, we talked about what it looks like to hear from the Holy Spirit, how we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, so, so and, and as part of that, we just read five verses in particular of the Holy Spirit, when he says stuff, it says, the Holy Spirit said, and at the top of the message notes on praise.fyi today, I just included all of the verses in the Bible when it says the Holy Spirit says something. So just like those five, you can read all of them this week. Feel free to kind of just dig your way through those, read them on your own. Um, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit is kind of a precursor to what we're going to talk about today, and, and, but it's not all of what we're going to talk about today. So read those this week. May the Holy Spirit speak to you. Today, I think the final step is, 
how to be led by the Holy Spirit. How to be led by the Holy Spirit, which is more than just hearing from the Holy Spirit. It's more. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says that those who are led by the Spirit are children of God. I want to be a child of God. I want to be able to be led by the Spirit. I want to hear Him, and then I want that to change the way I make decisions. My decisions, I don't want to just be my decisions. I want them to be decisions that are led by the Holy Spirit. And that's really what we're talking about today. And that's why we're back in the beginning of of Acts as well. Because right there in Acts chapter 1, there is this end of sorts, but it's also a beginning of sorts. And and, and you'll get it as as I'm reading through it. You'll pick up on what I'm talking about. It's like the ending of a, a specific time in the ministry of the church and the beginning of a new moment in the history of the church. And so we're going to start right in verse 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after having given his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. I love that. He began to do and teach. Jesus is still doing and teaching. This was just the beginning of Jesus doing and teaching, right? So, so he read or he shared all of the things in that last book, which is the book of Luke, about those things that Jesus began to do until the day he was taken up to heaven after having given his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this feels like an end, right? He's getting ready to head up to heaven. And even as he's beginning or getting ready to do that, he says, but just so you know, this is just the beginning of something new, right? This is, this is not just all that there is. Like I'm going to go and then you got to just wait this thing out. No, as soon as I go, someone else is going to come. And when he does, this is a new day for you. So verse 6. By the way, I'm not going to make it to Acts chapter 2. We're not getting to the story of Pentecost anywhere today. Just so you know, we're only going to read the lead up to Pentecost, just because I want to frustrate you. Verse 6. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they're asking him, is this the end, or is this the beginning of the end, right? Like, that's part of the reason why I love this, because it is this massive transition, and they're like, okay, is this... Is this the moment where you're going to inaugurate the full coming of the kingdom of God? And he says, wait, those things are for the Father to set, and it is not yet for you to know. Essentially, he says, no, this this is both the end, but it's also just the beginning, right? Like, this is the end of the beginning. Like, that's that's part of why I love this this passage, is it's kind of like torn between the two. But then he tells them, regardless— what you need to do is you need to wait for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this is how I feel every time somebody comes to me and says, looking at the current events of the day, and says, is this the end? Um, yes. Yes. We've been in the end for a really long time, right? So yes, as you look at the current events around you and you go, okay, this is eerily what Scripture says will happen, right? And, and then you're like, is this the end? Yes. Now, what Jesus says is this. So regardless, seek the Holy Spirit. Seek the power, presence, and leadership of the Holy Spirit. So for us, if it is, we should seek the power, presence, and leadership of the Holy Spirit. And if it's not the end, 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 we should seek the power, presence, and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Either way, we want him to inform our decisions. All right, verse 9. I'm going fast. After saying this, because last week I went 20 minutes over. 
I know you noticed. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah, all of a sudden everybody starts coughing like, um, yeah, we noticed, and I want you to know that I noticed. <laughs> right back at you. Golly. Fake coughs. All right. After saying this, he was taken up into the cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. So that's the end, right? Now in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit's going to show up. And when he shows up, it inaugurates a whole new day for the church. But we're not there yet. In fact, we're not going to get there, like I said today. What we're going to focus on is we are going to focus on the seven to ten days in between Jesus going up to heaven and the Holy Spirit coming down from heaven. Okay? And seven to ten-ish days, a week and a half, because Pentecost means 50 days, essentially, after Passover. And it says right before this, if you look back, it says that for 40 days he was appearing and then he showed up. So, or had ascend, ascended to heaven. So somewhere between seven and ten days, somewhere between a week and a week and a half, the disciples were in between. They were in between Jesus going up and the Holy Spirit coming down, which makes these days and what happens in them very, very important. Okay, because this is a big moment for them. So let's keep reading verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. So there's a big group of people there. Specifically, you get the names of, like, the apostles, and then you get a, a few others who have been with all the way from the beginning. And it says that they are spending this time united in prayer. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. So they are united in prayer and in Peter talking. So Peter starts talking and says, verse 16, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. So Peter is referring back to specifically a few verses which were David prophesying about the Messiah, the anointed one, being betrayed by someone who loved him. Okay? So he says this was all predicted. But I guarantee you this was a painful moment for them as they're opening this particular door and talking about what's behind it, right? So continues on. Uh, Judas, and this is just like a, a narrative kind of note. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling headfirst there, his body split open, spilling out all his intestines. So this isn't the G-rated version of what happened here. It's intense, and this isn't the only place that this is talked about. There's another place. I'm not going to get into it, but it also brings up the fact that um, Judas's end was not pretty. Verse 19, the news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place, that, the, place the Aramaic name Akeldama, which means field of blood. Verse 20, Peter continued. This was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. Now, what comes next for the disciples is a process of deciding on someone to replace Judas. Peter pulls from a few different spots in Scripture in order to say, hey, we got to fill this slot. And I've heard people say that this was the wrong decision that this is, was not for them to do, that the 12th apostle was supposed to be Paul. 
I've heard multiple people say something like that, and that may be true. Um, it may be that they weren't supposed to fill this spot. Maybe. I don't know. How they fill the spot, though, it is very interesting to me, and I believe important for us to see. And so I want to watch as they make a decision on how to fill a leadership opening. The reason why it's of particular interest to me is because this is one of the greatest responsibilities I have as the pastor of praise. And if you want to ask anybody who has been a part of these sorts of decisions, they can attest to you that this is something that we do very carefully, we do very methodically, we do hopefully led by the Holy Spirit. But we take this very seriously. It is very important to make sure we get the right voices speaking into praise, right? So this is something that, for me, like I lock in on as soon as I see it, right? So it catches my attention, and I start asking questions of it, which is what led me to this morning. So it, it sometimes can be a difficult thing to make those kinds of decisions. Sometimes it results in kind of a pain point between people you and those you love because as you're making those decisions and you're seeking the Holy Spirit, it doesn't feel right. In spite of the fact that you want with everything inside of you for it to feel right, you're like, this, this doesn't seem like it's God. And so you kind of move forward a different direction. And then all of a sudden as the pastor to make a decision that isn't that, it can cause pain for people who are involved. And so for me, this is like, really close to my heart. Like truly, every time we do a leadership hire or search, it is something we just take so, so seriously. And they do too. You can tell they have a whole lot of care that they put into it. Verse 21. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus's resurrection. So they set some basic parameters. This person needs to be somebody who saw Jesus get baptized and then traveled with us and then saw Jesus die and raised from the dead. So some kind of basic parameters before you do anything else. For us, um, we set parameters as well when we're making a search for somebody at praise. Like we, we will say, hey, first off, if the resume has spelling errors, <laughs> if it has basic grammatical errors, because if you won't put the time and the care and the effort into making sure your first impression is strong, you're not going to put a lot of effort into your 100th impression. And so for us, we're just like, nah, no, nah, no, nope, nope, thanks. The other thing is we always want to see that this person is serving somewhere. Because if they're not serving somewhere currently and they're just looking for a position, that is not the right heart. We want to see somebody who is not wasting the time they have where they are right now. And if they are serving, then that makes it through that second parameter of, hey, the, this person now can be considered. For them, they had to see Jesus um, be baptized, they had to walk with Jesus, and then they had to see Jesus die and they needed to see him after the resurrection so that this person can attest to those things being true. So they narrow it down then to two people. Um, do, 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 do. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. So they get it down to two. This is what we do too. First time we were doing a youth search, we, I think I mentioned this, it's been like eight or nine years now, but first time we did a youth search, I said, before we do anything, before we take any steps at all, we are going to get 100 resumes in for one position. So we waited until we got 100 resumes, and then once we had those 100 resumes, there was an easy 40, 50, right? But then we narrowed it down to 10, and then we narrowed it down to 3, and then we narrowed it down to 2 before we did, like, really serious bring them in for interviews type of things. And that was a hard, long process. Here they narrow it down to two. You got two men. One's named Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, 
and Matthias. Now, if I were making the decision, I can guarantee you who I'm going to choose. I'm not choosing the guy with three names. <laughs> Bartholomew, or no, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice. If every time I call the guy, I have to say Joseph, known as, or called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, come over here real quick. I'm not going to do that. He's obviously struggling with his identity. Like he doesn't even know who he is. Pick one name. So you got one guy with three names, another guy with Matthias. Like, I'm choosing Matthias. Anyways, I'm not saying that's it. But So they get down to two people. And then here's what they do. And then they prayed, O oh Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry. For he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. So they pray. We do this as well. They say, God, you know every heart. You know what we don't know. And so help us to know who would be the right person to replace Judas. Verse 26. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. So they prayed, and they cast lots to make the decision. And Matthias was chosen probably because he had only one name. Not entirely sure, but probably. Now, when it says they cast lots, we're not 100% sure what that actually means. Like, probably it means some sort of shards of pottery or something with names on it that were put into some sort of receptacle, and they prayed, and then they reached in and grabbed one. And they trusted that in that process that God would help them to select the one that he wanted them to select. What this isn't is in the Old Testament, there's a thing called the Urim and the Thummim, right? And some of you know what that is and some of you don't. In the Old Testament, they had these two gemstones and the priest would seek God's, and again, we're not entirely sure what it looks like because it doesn't show up a bunch, Like, it's just referred to a couple of times. And so we're like, so as they were making decisions, it always had to be a binary decision. Like, it had to be either yes or no, this one or that one, right? And they would, they had the Urim and they had the Thummim, and they would do something very similar to that. It shows up in, let me me just give you a verse. Exodus 28, verse 30. Exodus 28, verse 30. Insert the Urim and the Thummim into the sacred chess piece so that, They will be carried over Aaron's heart when he goes into the Lord's presence. In this way, Aaron will always carry over his heart the objects used to determine the Lord's will for his people whenever he goes in before the Lord. So these show up, just so you know, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Ezra and Nehemiah, just briefly mentioned. 1 Samuel chapter 14, it also is most likely that, which, uh, well, that's what it says. Saul is trying to figure out who ate when he had called a fast. So he gathers all the people together, and he puts certain people over here and here, and then they draw one, and they're like, oh, it's this people. And they keep narrowing it down until they find out it was Saul and his son, and then eventually Jonathan, who had eaten when Saul had said, don't eat. And it's very clear that God was leading that because Jonathan was the one who ate when he wasn't supposed to be eating. But it always had to be this yes, no, him or her, up or down. And so that's what they do here without it being apparently the Urum and the Thummim, they ask God for guidance, and then they cast lots. Now, this isn't the only place that this happens, too. Lots as a thing, casting lots, shows up in the Old Testament. We know David cast lots in order to uh, figure out whether or not he should make a certain decision. We know Joshua cast lots as they were trying to figure out who would get which land and when they would go and fight and all of that sort of thing, that there was a casting of lots that happened there as well. In the New Testament, we know that it was because of the casting of lots that Zechariah was in the temple on the day when the angel appeared to him. He was there because they had cast lots and it was up to him to go in. And that's when the angel appears and says, your wife is going to have a child, right? So they weren't the only ones to do this. The Romans cast lots, and 
There are occasions where it's clear that they would choose generals based on lots. And there were times when they would decide who would go into battle based on lots. The Greeks did that as well. They, there are recorded occurrences where they would cast lots in order to decide who was in leadership. They would cast lots in order to do that. We know that when Jesus was being crucified, that the Roman soldiers cast lots in order to get his robe like his, the thing he was wearing. They were, now, that's probably not like casting, casting lots. In fact, even in the New Living Translation, it seems to be more like a gambling. They go with, they rolled dice for Jesus' clothes. But here the disciples are. They want to know what is God's will. And so, after praying, they cast lots to decide, after setting qualifications, narrowing down the field and praying, they probably pull out a shard of of pottery to say, this is the one that God has chosen, okay? Now, the very next verse, I'm going to go back over there. The very next verse is Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. We're not going to get into that. So this is, then, the last thing that happens before Acts 2 and the Holy Spirit descends. Okay, so it's also the very first thing that the disciples decide after Jesus goes to heaven. So as part of the Acts of the Apostles, is what this book is called in my Bible, the Acts of the Apostles, this is the very first Act of the Apostles. So the first Act of Acts is them deciding on a leader, and the way they find, the way that they should go in that decision is they pray, they narrow it down, They set qualifications, they pray, and then they cast lots. Decisions are one of the most difficult things in leadership because you know every decision you make, at least one person is not going to like it. It's just the way it is. And so if you want to be in leadership, you need to know That in general, every time you make a decision, there will be somebody who will disagree. So you don't get into leadership because you want everybody to love you. And so decisions are hard knowing that because often decisions will make negative impact on people. And so you know that. And every decision you make takes willpower. It's been proven. Studies show Every decision you make, if you make a lot of decisions in one day, you are more likely when you see the chocolate cake at the end of the day to eat it. The whole thing, like not a piece, the whole thing. It's proven, like your willpower decreases as you make a lot of decisions, especially if they're emotionally straining ones. But even if they're not, if you make a lot of decisions through the day, you are less likely to have willpower at the end of the day. Bigger decisions cause bigger um, kind of costs to you, right? Right? So when I was a teenager, I worked at Sears. And I've told you this before, and I, I love this story for, for a couple of reasons, but I was thinking about it a lot lately in relation to this series. Because when I worked at Sears, I worked in the shoe department. And then I worked in the tool department. And then I worked in the big garden department. Like, and all of those were like, uh, they were, what, what is that called? Where you get a portion of the sales? Commission, yeah, thank you. I haven't done that in a while. So, but I did really good. So like when I'm 16, 17 years old, all my friends got no money, but I had money. And it was super cool. And so Sears has always had kind of a soft space in my heart because of that. And so watching Sears implode has been more painful for me than probably you. You're like, oh, Sears is gone now. Yeah, oh well. For me, it's kind of like, oh, Sears is gone. It's a bummer. But in the 90s, Sears was killing it. When I was working there, Sears was crushing it because we had a CEO whose name was Arthur Martinez. Here's a picture of him. He just looks like the kind of grandpa you want to have, right? Like, that is a... 
He looks a little no-nonsense, but he's trying to hide it, you know? But Arthur Martinez was named CEO of the year in 1996. The reason why was he was unafraid to make hard decisions. So specifically, right before I got hired there, Sears laid off 50,000 employees in one shot. The reason why they laid off 50,000 employees was because the bottom line was underwater. And Sears was massive at this point. Like, I don't know if you know this, like, oh man, what are, Allstate? I think Allstate was owned by Sears at that point. Who else was? Uh, some banking. I can't remember. But there was like, Discover Card, of course, was owned by Sears. There was others as well. Like, they had all of these things under their covering, right? So Sears starts spinning all those things off. Well, one of the big ones was their mail order catalog. So their mail order catalog had 50,000 employees, and they canned it. And the reason why he canned it was he said this, we could spend three years fixing the catalog, but it still would have been a nicely restored 50s automobile. What we had to do was focus on our stores. Everything else had to go. So he lays off 50,000 employees and pivots only to brick and mortar. And for like three to four years, Sears takes off, just through the roof. He wrote a book called The Hard Road to the Softer Side. If you remember the softer side of Sears, that was his thing. And so he wrote a book, and he was CEO of the year in 1996. You know what else happened in 1996? Amazon went public. The same year he was being lauded as the CEO of the year because he was unafraid to make difficult decisions. He had just made the decision and the thing he was lauded for was killing Sears' future. And he had no idea because before Amazon became the online mail order catalog, Sears had all of the infrastructure in place. And so I've thought about that so many times because there is no way Arthur Martinez could have had any knowledge of what was to come. And so his decision was based on the numbers. It was based on everything that in a human kind of point of view, you could make a decision on. And yet, if he had had a little more elevation, and if he could see what was just around the corner, he could have out Amazon to Amazon because that's what Sears was. It's not his fault. He couldn't have known. And so many times, I think, leadership decisions feel like that. It's just a roll of the dice because we don't really know what's coming. We have no idea what's right around the corner. And so it feels like a roll of the dice. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. This verse holds the distinction of being the last decision the apostles make before Pentecost. But it also holds the distinction of being the first decision they make before or after Christ had ascended. In other words, this decision is the first and last decision of the unbaptized church. So it's a pretty important decision, right? It's a unique pivot. It is also the last time in Scripture that anyone casts lots. Never again. After Pentecost, the model for decision-making changes. Acts chapter 15 kind of speaks to this. The church is trying to decide major things again because it seems like people who are not a part of the Jewish culture were coming to Christ. So they have to decide, well, what does this mean? Do they need to become Jewish before they can become Christian? So they call a council of the church, which sounds super dry, right? They have a big meeting where everybody, 
uses Robert's rules of order and they make decisions based on that. And that feels kind of dry. But as they're making the decision, here's what it says in Acts chapter 15, verse 28. After they had gone all the way through this, this is what it says. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. The way decisions are made now is different. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They don't cast lots, right? So even as you step back and you think about this, this was Acts chapter 1, verse, the, the last verse there was the, verse 26, was the last day of lots. 49 days after Easter was the last day of lots in the Christian church. Our world changed. The way we make decisions changes. It is now a partnership with the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And, and, and so it includes two pieces. One, the Holy Spirit. Two, us. It's a partnership. I, I used to love the story of Moses when he was going out in the desert. I was talking to the board about this recently as we were leading into a board meeting, and I was, I was, I love that picture, and it's very appealing to me for when you're in front leading, and, and then what's great is he had this like pillar of fire and smoke that every day would either stay or go, and if it went, then you would go along with it, and, and when it stopped, then you would stop along with it, and you would camp. I love that. It's very appealing to me because then it's not my fault. It's his fault, right? Like, I just followed the cloud, right? Like, and so I'm like, oh, man, that sounds really fantastic. But even as I'm reading that story in Numbers chapter 10, it actually says that right after it establishes this method of you just watch the cloud and do what the cloud does, Moses stops and he turns to his brother-in-law, who's a guy named Hobab, and Hobab wasn't going to go with them into the desert. He's like, why would I go with you? I'm not going with you. And, and Moses is like, please go with us. And he says, the reason why I want you to go with us is because you know the good places to camp in the wilderness. And I'm like, well, wait, what? I thought you have a pillar of cloud and fire and it goes ahead of you and it stops, you stop and you camp. That's exactly what Moses had. But he also asked his brother-in-law, an expert in the desert, to come along too. Because he knows the good places to camp. And it doesn't attack Moses or say that Moses did something wrong. And this is what I see as the way decision-making ought to look. It's a combination of wisdom and wonder, of spirit and strategy. This is Pentecost, but also planning, hand in hand. It's saying, hey, the Holy Spirit can speak through the wisdom of others, but he also speaks directly to each and every one of us. It is a combination of those two things, hand in hand. But it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. You got to know what seems good to the Holy Spirit. The only way that happens is if you treat the Holy Spirit as a person. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit, and it seemed good to us. The Holy Spirit is a him. The Holy Spirit's preferred pronouns are he, him, his, not it, it, its. He is a person, and he wants to be treated as a person. And so let me quickly, if we've talked about how, what it looks like to hear the Holy Spirit, now how do we make decisions and move led by the Holy Spirit? Let me just really quickly give you some do's that they do. Do, they know him, they trust him, and they follow his lead. And I'm going to give you the verses there so you can write them down and look it up and see what that might look like for you. That sounds to me like friendship. That sounds like fellowship. That sounds like people who think of the Holy Spirit as a friend. 
They know him, they trust him, and they follow his lead. Is that how you think of him? Because if not, you might need to change the way you think of him. Now, let me be totally open with you, and this is very foolish, and I will tell you it's foolish right up front. But I want you to know the journey that I have been on in order to get to that point where I think of the Holy Spirit as my friend. Because for a while, as much as I said I did, I didn't. I treated the Holy Spirit as an it, not as a him, as a he. So for me, recognizing that that was the case, that I would treat him like an ethereal kind of thing, I changed the way I did something. So in my office downstairs is where I usually will spend praying. And I noticed, man, I'm just not talking to him. Like, I don't have a problem recognizing and speaking to Jesus as a person. But the Holy Spirit, I wasn't. So what I did was I set up a chair. And it's a very special chair. Here's a picture of the chair. Now, I want you to know that's an illicit chair that I am not supposed to have. And I won't tell you how I got that chair because there'd be multiple people who might get in trouble. That is a chair from Central Bible College on the court for basketball. This was back when I was playing basketball at Central Bible College. Okay, so I didn't play basketball at Central Bible College. But I just set out this chair, and it sits right next to where I pray. And now, when I talk to the Holy Spirit, I talk to him like he is sitting in that chair. Because I figure if the Holy Spirit's going to sit somewhere, it'll be in a CBC chair, <laughs> right? Yes. Praise the Lord. So, so I just talk to him like he's sitting in that chair next to me. And I know that's foolish, and it's not for everybody. For me, it was what was necessary in order to get over that particular hump, to be able to say, the Holy Spirit is my friend, and I talk to him like he is my friend, and I follow his lead like he is my friend, and I walk with him like he is my friend, because he is your friend. He is your helper. He is walking with you through these things. And one time, as I was sitting there talking to an empty chair, as if the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was in the room, there's no doubt. He's in this room right now, right? And so as I was talking to him, like he's in the room because he is, he said some things to me. I didn't like him at first. I didn't like what he had to say. And I guess that brings me to, if you've seen the do's of friendship with the Holy Spirit, let me show you the don'ts of friendship with the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve him, quench him, or resist him. Don't grieve him, quench him, or resist him. And there's the verses for those. If you want, it's going to leave that up there on the screen for a bit. You can write those down. You can research those and read those and think about them and pray them this week. Don't grieve him, quench him, or resist him. Not if you're his friend. If you're his friend, you know what he likes and what he doesn't like. If you're his friend, you listen to him. A few weeks back, someone I know did something that hurt someone that I deeply love. And again, this is foolish and open and transparent, but I literally said the words, and I, as soon as I said them, I said, man, I, I just don't know how I'm going to be able to forgive that person. And as soon as I said that, the Holy Spirit said, um, Alan... I can't tell you what that was like because it won't be the same for you as it is for me. I will say, for me, I heard him as, um, Alan. And I went, ah, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. Should have kept that one to myself. And then a week or two went by, and the Holy Spirit revisited it because I ran into this person that I didn't think I could forgive. And I had to sit next to that person. And I, so if you sat next to me recently, it's not you, okay? It's not anybody in this church. I just, if you're wondering, like, oh, is it me? But the Holy Spirit said to me at that point, you had better be real careful because this is the beginning of a path you do not want to walk down. 
Because what is just a little root of bitterness right now will grow to take every area of your life. Every area. And it will cut you off from the grace of God. And as a pastor, and as a father, and as a husband, this will ruin everything for you. So as I'm like repenting of that, the Holy Spirit then said to me, and just so you know, you've done this with this person as well. And I'm like, come on, Holy Spirit. Like, that's not fair. Like, I'm focusing on one right now. Like, don't bring up another one. But he did. And then he said, and the very thing that you are having such a hard time with that person, that is exactly who you're going to end up as. And I'm, man, like, ouch. But... That's what it looks like to hear the Holy Spirit. What it looks like to be led by the Holy Spirit is to do something based on that. To take a step to respond, to say, okay, you're right, I'm with you, let's go. Let's go through this process that I don't want to go through because I know it's the right thing and because you're with me through it and you're going to help me through it. That's what it looks like to be led by the Holy Spirit, to allow him to impact your decisions. Life is a series of decisions. We are making decisions every day, time after time, decision after decision. We are constantly making those decisions. And there was a time when those decisions could feel like just a roll of the dice. But you and I have a friend who turns that roll of the dice into something so much more certain. Because the Holy Spirit is not just with you in this moment. He stands outside of time and he sees what's coming around the corner. And so he can say to you things like, Alan, this is the beginning of a path that you do not want to end up at the end of. Because he sees where that goes, and you might not. You might just think, oh, it's just a little bitterness. And he says to you, no, those things grow and grow and grow, and it will take all of you. That's where it leads. Because he can see what you cannot see. And so as we're at the end of the beginning here, a new day, I want us to hear the Holy Spirit. But more than anything else, I want that to impact the way we make decisions. That it impacts how we do what we do. That we are led by the Holy Spirit. And some decisions are big, and some decisions seem little. And in every single one of them, there are things he knows that you do not. So as you make them, make them as one who says, it seemed good to me and to the Holy Spirit. The days of dice are over. The 49th day after Easter was the last day of lots. Now our decisions are decisions that we walk with our friend through. This is what it looks like. Boy, with everything inside of me, I hope for those who have not experienced that sort of thing, that you would desire it, that you would long for it, that you would seek it. And for those of you who had an experience one time, there is so much more. There is so much more. Because that's how he leads. So join with your partner, the Holy Spirit. Talk to him like a friend. Follow his lead and see where it takes you.